Alright, um, good. Uh, yeah, my name is Christian Koch. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the next step. So on the way of contr towards control. So um, most of our talk uh, that follows in the coming session is, is about uh, control of underwater vehicles. And um, so with this talk, we're going to prepare this a little bit um, because there's no control without actuation. So we're going to talk about uh, a bit about uh, actuation mod modalities. That means like different modes of uh, actuations that we typically find in in marine uh, vessels, um, and then also talk about the topic of control allocation. And uh, we'll do that in that uh, order. Okay. So, quick overview about. Um, um, actuation techniques that we that we typically find. So essentially we can divide this into two different categories. Um, one is uh, active, so there's especially propulsion. Um, so that could be um, uh, yeah, like a, like a, like a propeller, um, those kind of things. Talk a bit a little bit about this um, and also passive ones like control surfaces. So the typical thing that we'll find on um, on our uh, AUVs and ROVs are uh, electric thrusters. And um, generally, um, they all like like uh, thrusters, propellers, that fall into the same category here. Um, we have some examples. So like uh, the first image shows uh, um, a propeller uh, on a submarine. So that is like a, like a military submarine here. Um, and but like yeah, generally uh, you find these uh, typically also on 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 all kinds of uh, vessels. Uh, it's the main mode of uh, propulsion generally. There are some special types. Um, so what you sometimes find uh, are um, so-called azimuth thrusters, which are rotatable. So they can uh, produce uh, a thrust not only not always in the same direction, but can be. Um, can be rotated, and then there are also um, variations of this where they are rotated in multiple degrees of freedom. So, like uh, not only on one axis, but generally then on on two. Um, and uh, the third image shows uh, uh, like a small thruster, which can typically be used um, on on smaller AUVs, and uh, um, these are generally um, electric. Another mode of propulsion is uh, so-called hydrojets. So here, um, uh, water. There's a water intake that uh, sucks up the water, accelerates the water, and um, uh, produces this uh, jet stream um, as a mean of propulsion. Um, they are typically um, found on um, speedboats, um, but uh, they also found their way now into uh, uh, into smaller vehicles and and robots. Um, um, you find some ASVs, um, so surface vehicles with these uh, um, mode of propulsion, and um, also uh, to some extent uh, AUVs. Uh, although this is probably more in the research domain, um, they. Uh, uh, they are generally one uh, one directional, so um, you typically only get a forward um, force, and uh, that is uh, not uh, necessarily reversible. Talking about um, passive means of uh, um, of actuation, uh, what we typically find as uh, control surfaces. So um, uh, the most typical one is a, is a rudder um, here shown, like on the uh, the after rudder of um, a big container ship, which um, is typically installed in such a way, so um, directly uh, in front of a propeller um, to change the direction of the um, stream and affect the, the, uh, the thrust direction. So with this, uh, with this, of course, it's possible, and you'll know this, to, to um, turn the vehicle, uh, in a, in, but um, it is generally not possible to do so without propulsion. Yeah, so these um, these passive uh, control surfaces they cannot work 
um, at zero velocity. So they need some sort of initial velocity. Something else you uh, often find is um, our fins. Yeah, so uh, they have a similar, um, well, they can be used for a similar effect. So to, to change the direction um, of flow, um, oftentimes you can find them on, um, on submarines to um, control the pitch. Uh, but they're also used on, on ships um, as stabilizers. Uh, these can be passive, but can also be active. Oh, like with active, I mean um, the, 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 the angle of attack can be changed. Sometimes it cannot. OK, we're going to mostly talk about uh, thrusters from now on, uh, as this is the most uh, um, common uh, mode of actuation for robotic vehicles. And uh, we're going to talk about a bit about modeling the thrusters. So we talked a lot about uh, um, modeling of the of the vehicle itself, and now we're going to talk a little bit about the modeling of the thruster. So generally, what we have is um, we have this uh, um, the actuator, typically an electric uh, motor. Uh, that uh, drives a propeller, which then accelerates the water, and thus produces a force. Um, to quantify this force, um, we can, um, um, yeah, fall back to different models. So a very simple one would be um, a static model where we assume um, that there are no internal dynamics and uh, that we have a, um, yeah, a linear relationship or quasi-linear relationship between um, some input, well, which can be a current, can be a voltage, uh, or typically also a, a motor torque. And what we have uh, as the output is um, the thruster force that is actually produced. So, and this model is is is, is widely used, um, in, especially in in control. Uh, it's a very simple model, uh, but it has a lot of limitations. Uh, because um, it generally assumes that the that the uh, the relationship so from from uh, input to output is instantaneous, um, so that is has no dynamics, um, and uh, it also assumes some sort of uh, static um, relationship here, which is generally not true. Uh, when we're moving into in the water, um, it also changes the uh, the force that is produced. So, and we look in, in at, at, at some more models that um, try to quantify these. But generally speaking, this is a, um, a very common uh, model, um, very common assumption um, that uh, you will find uh, very often. If we extend this model to rotatable thrusters, um, we can essentially split the vector of thrust into two components, into an X and a Y direction. So this could be the surge and the sway direction of a vehicle or in any other um, local uh, reference frame. And um, we typically have a relationship uh, that uh, uh, is dependent on the angle um, of, uh, of the thruster um, to some um, initial conditions, some reference, and uh, so, for example, for this uh, um, little example here, the relationship as given here shown uh, holds. So we have a, a simple um, geometric relationship uh, based on the cosinus and sinus of um, of the angle. So let's uh, have a quick look about uh, slightly more complex models. So um, one, uh, as I said, like um, the previous model um, does not uh, assume any uh, dynamic states. And the um, uh, first extension to this uh, was done um, uh, Cook and uh, Sloting 
who uh, introduced the um, propeller angular velocity as a dynamic state. So, and the model then essentially um, you know, says that uh, the uh, change in angular velocity uh, depends on the uh, input torque, uh, which is denoted u, and um, uh, also uh, depends on the um, the velocity of the um, of the propeller itself. So it's uh, essentially this alpha um, uh, and times uh, the absolute value of n is uh, is the quadratic damping. And um, the output equation of this model um, then relates the uh, quadratic velocity of uh, the propeller to the uh, output force. And here we have the model parameters alpha and beta and uh, uh, C, T. These are the three parameters that one needs to um, yeah, uh, identify. So here we have um, uh, input torque uh, as the model, but this can also be changed to current, uh, which is just a um, well, there's a, uh, yeah, just another proportional um, constant there, and uh, it can also be velocity um, input voltage uh, if one wants to. So then more iterations later. Um, uh, we have a third order model um, by uh, Fossen and Blanke, who uh, not only have um, the uh, propeller velocity as a state, but also the, uh, the vehicle forward velocity and the axial flow velocity inside the propeller. So, as I said, like well, one can easily imagine that um, the, uh, the amount of thrust that can be produced does not only depend on the velocity of the propeller, but also how fast the propeller is already moving in the water column. And this is uh, what's approximated here. So, and uh, if we look at these uh, three equations, then the, the first equation is essentially um, approximates the, um, the electric motor or uh, models the electric motor. The uh, second one um, is, uh, 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 tries to take care of the the hydrodynamics um, of the uh, of the axial flow, and the uh, third equation uh, essentially is taken from the uh, Fossen model that Bilal um, presented earlier, and uh, um, relates the um, forward uh, or, uh, yeah the forward velocity of the vehicle. Yeah, so, and um, this model does not only uh, calculate the thrust of force, which is T, but also uh, the propeller torque. Yeah, so, the propeller has to accelerate the water, so um, it, ha it itself has to um, produce a torque, and this uh, um, torque acts at the same time, not only on the propeller, of course, but also on the thruster uh, housing and and then on the on the vehicle and uh, um, in some cases this needs to be um, adjusted for taken care of uh, or considered in the control um, oftentimes though it can be ignored yeah that's all so we come quite a long way from like a very simple linear model to a third order non-linear uh, model and uh, with many steps in between. So there are uh, various models out there uh, depending on, on various needs. Um, yeah. Okay, let's now have a look at uh, um, not so much a model of the thrusters or how, how input relates to output torque now the output force, but more like, okay, how does thruster actually affect the vehicle? So that is the question here. So, for example, we have three different bodies, uh, underwater vehicles, uh, shown in with these uh, yellow blobs, and uh, each are equipped with some thrusters. 
And uh, the, the question essentially is, OK, how does each of the thruster affect the vehicle? So what happens if I turn on the on on one of the thrusters? How would the vehicle move? Uh, and uh, I mean, this is, uh, I think, um, can also be clear from intuition. So in the in the first case, for example, on the on the left side, um, we see that the mm, thruster is sort of always pushing this uh, this uh, vehicle in one direction, um, and uh, say ignoring hydrodynamic effects and, and lift forces, um, this would always go into in a straight line. Um, Yeah, but there's a different, uh, for example, in the second case, where we uh, have uh, now two thrusters. So, and I think from intuition, it's always also clear that this uh, vehicle can not only go forward, but can also change its direction by um, operating one of the thrusters at a higher uh, output level than the others. Um, um, the third case might also be interesting. So here we also have one thruster, but it's uh, sort of in a different location and, and to, to, at a different angle. And um, so what uh, what will happen here is essentially um, that uh, this uh, vehicle will um, move in a circle, uh, turn and, and, and uh, move at the same time. And um, so this is like what I said. It's mostly ignoring now the, the hydrodynamic effects of the uh, of the behavior of the vehicle, which of course has a big influence. Um, but uh, point is essentially that uh, the location of the thrusters matters matters quite a lot. And um, understanding how a thruster affects the the movement of the vehicle is of course essential for any control task that mine, one might need to do. So that means, of course, we need um, a systematic approach to uh, quantify these effects. And um, essentially, what this means is, um, if we uh, we want to have, we want to see how, like, uh, um, how can we uh, find the generalized forces that the thruster produces with respect to some reference frame. Uh, so and. Uh, the generalized forces also uh, uh, can be collected in the wrench. So the wrench is a vector um, often denoted tau, and it collects the generalized forces and moments uh, in six degrees of freedom. So this would be um, a force in the x direction, in the y direction, and the z direction, and uh, a torque around the x axis, y axis, and z axis. And this is uh, this is very specific, of course, to uh, the um, um, frame of reference that's being used. Um, this can commonly be uh, the um, yeah, this is the origin. Also, we would use the body fixed frame for this, uh, generally speaking. And uh, this can also, if it coincides with the center of gravity, um, the equations simplify a little bit. So this is often um, assumed. OK, so we defined the range vector. So now um, if we want to calculate the range that is produced by a certain thruster, uh, we can um, we first have to uh, look at the thruster itself, um, what uh, direction it uh, the force is pr being produced, and um, what is the magnitude. And these can be collected in a vector, in a thruster force vector f, um, which uh, in the same frame of reference as the uh, as the wrench needs to be uh, given the, the uh, give the force in the x y and z direction and in a similar way it could also cover um, torques but um, uh, this is uh, um, yeah is that like often often ignored Okay, so this is one thing, and then um, what else do we need? We need the moment arm L um, from the uh, frame of reference to the uh, uh, to the thruster. So essentially, if you have um, this um, vector f and extend it, 
then the vector L is uh, perpendicular to this line. Yeah, and um, we can now easily calculate um, the branch vector. Uh, essentially, it just uh, copies all the forces, the linear forces, and for the uh, um, torque, what we'll have is um, uh, uh, this uh, moment arm L cross product with the force vector, and this gives us the the torques in on the x, y, and z axis. Okay, so um, if we don't know, generally we have more than one thruster. So for a configuration with uh, multiple thrusters or multiple actuators. It is uh, common to collect those values in uh, in a matrix. So if we assume we have like a vehicle with M thrusters, then we can collect the forces um, of each, uh, so the scalar forces of each uh, thruster uh, in um, in a vector uh, f. So here we have f1, f2, f2, fn, and these are like the scalar, uh, like the magnitude of force produced by each each thruster. So, and um, we can now um, relate these values um, through this uh, um, through a matrix T, which is also called the thrust allocation matrix. So we can relate this in a linear way uh, to our range. So the range is this uh, thrust allocation matrix times the vector containing all the thruster forces. And this is done essentially in the same way as um, as I've shown you on the um, previous page. Yeah, sometimes in, in literature you also find different names for thruster location matrix. Uh, sometimes uh, some refer to it as the thruster configuration matrix or the thruster control matrix um, or control allocation matrix. So there are different names for the, for essentially the same thing. So all of what I said before is assuming that the the thrusters are not rotatable. So if they are rotatable, then this matrix T will depend on an angle alpha or on the angles of the uh, thrusters alpha. So um, a notion about uh, uh, fully actuated versus underactuated. So um, that is an important question in, in robotics generally and in underwater robotics uh, as well. So. The vehicle is fully actuated if this matrix T has full rank. So, and that essentially means that we have an actuator that can, um, or we have a, a mean to actuate a certain degree of freedom. And if we don't have this, then the, the vehicle is it's called under actuated. So, um, and we'll, we'll see some examples of this. Uh, one thing to point out here is that um, since the matrix T is dependent is, is dependent on this uh, angles alpha. Um, it can be that uh, for different uh, uh, orientations of the thruster, this matrix does lose rank, uh, and thus the the vehicle becomes um, uncontrollable in a certain degree of freedom. So if we look at, at a few simple examples, just to make things a bit clear, um, so. What we have here is a very simple uh, vehicle with uh, three thrusters, two in uh, on a uh, uh, on a horizontal plane and one uh, vertically. And uh, so, if we look at uh, what kind of motions this vehicle can uh, form and um, yeah, how uh, like what degrees of freedom are controllable, I think uh, we can. Quickly see that this con this uh, vehicle is not uh, fully actuated, so we can, for example, not go sideways. Uh, so the, re the red uh, arrow marks the forward direction, so we cannot go sideways. And that is uh, exactly the uh, exactly what it what it cannot. Um, so it cannot go uh, uh, in the sway direction. Um, but also rotations are not controllable, so we cannot uh, control the roll. And we can also not control the pitch. So we only have one thruster um, in in the vertical direction. Um, 
that can be used for um, uh, yeah, to, to, to dive, so for heave, but um, it cannot really have an impact on, on, on roll and pitch. So that is depending on where the center of gravity is. Yeah. And typically, and this is this is not uncommon. It's not uncommon configuration to only have one thrust in that direction, even for um, like uh, medium-priced um, ROVs. Uh, they they um, sometimes only have one thruster there, and the reason is that um, uh, oftentimes these vehicles are um, designed to be as uh, hydrostatically stable as possible. So with a lot of buoyancy on top and a lot of weight. Uh, at the bottom, so it's it's very hard to not to like to induce a roll or pitch movement anyways. So there's no need to control these uh, these degrees of freedoms, and um, typically you also uh, want to just face um, straight. So it is not uncommon to have a configuration like this where roll and pitch is uncontrollable. Okay, so now. Um, uh, we have a slightly different configuration. So now we have uh, four vertical, uh, four horizontal thrusters um, that are each at an angle. That's also something that can typically be seen um, with uh, ROVs, so remotely controlled oper uh, operated uh, vehicles. And now we have uh, two thrusters in the on the vertical plane. So we have six thrusters um, for six degrees of freedom. So one could assume that uh, maybe now we can control all degrees of freedom, but uh, again now we have the uh, well we can go, go sideways for example by um, uh, controlling the four uh, vertical thrusters in the appropriate way. Um, so essentially on the xy plane we can go in arbitrary direction. We can rotate on the spot. So um, these degrees of freedom are covered, uh, but what's not covered is in this case the roll. So around the search axis, the forward axis. Um, pitch we can't control on the other hand. Yeah, but so still this this vehicle is underactuated. Um, in theory, you have enough thrusters to uh, um, to to control each degree of freedom, but due to the configuration, um, we cannot. Last example, okay, we introduced even more thrusters. Now we have uh, a total of eight. Um, and uh, yeah, I think you, you know what, uh, what's coming next. So in this case, we are fully actuated. We can, we can um, control all rotations. So yaw, roll, and pitch are all controllable, as well as all translations are controllable. Okay, so... Um, that brings you to the topic of control allocation. So now that we know that de depending on where the thruster is, uh, it will have an impact on a different impact on the um, motion of the vehicle. Now the question is, okay, if we want a certain motion of, or we want a certain force, what kind of, how do we need to actuate our thrusters? Yeah. So that's essentially um, the control allocation problem. So if we look at the control architecture, on control chain, we usually have um, uh, a controller or more controllers that take a reference and then produce um, uh, some sort of generalized forces to achieve these uh, reference. So in this case, uh, um, a controller that is uh, producing a wrench. Um, and then, so there's like the desired wrench. The controller location now needs to find the thruster forces that are necessary to produce the desired wrench. Yeah. And uh, then these uh, forces can be um, given to the, to the vehicle and um, then the vehicle feeds back position velocity and that closes the, the control loop. Yeah, so um, an alternative way to think about this is um, to, to uh, find the um, control input U. Yeah. So, depending on the relationship between U, so the input to the thruster and F, the output of the thruster, um, this needs to be also taken into account. Uh, if a linear relationship is assumed, then um, uh, this is uh, trivial. So um, if you go back to non-rotatable thrusters uh, on a vehicle and uh, 
we saw that we have uh, we can we can uh, form this uh, thrust allocation equation uh, with the thrust allocation matrix um, in the form of uh, tau equals t times f with the thrust allocation matrix t and uh, it can now be um, very simple to uh, to find the um, thruster forces by taking the pseudo inverse of t so t is not generally um, inversible but um, uh, using the pseudo inverse we get sort of like a uh, these squares um, yeah approximation um, or a least square solution on of this um, um, of this uh, um, uh, linear equation. Um, and um, the nice thing about this is if the thrusters are not rotatable, then um, T is constant. So T inverse or T pseudo inverse is constant. And so this only needs to be calculated once. And then um, the calculations uh, can be done uh, very, very efficiently. So this is a, a common approach, but uh, there are um, several issues. So, for example, um, this generally assumes that um, the thruster forces can be arbitrary large. Uh, so um, no matter what your desired range is, it will find you a vector of F that um, satisfies it at least uh, in the least square sense. And um, if uh, it, it cannot, uh, um, so if the if this F vector is, is too large, it has um, values that cannot be achieved by the actuators, then you need to find some sort of way to either saturate or uh, um, scale it down. But um, uh, yeah, you have to, it cannot, it does not do this inherently. So for example, what can happen is um, if you, uh, if the, um, thrust force is too reasonable that one of the, the thrusters saturates, but others might not. So you, if you do not scale it properly, then um, you will get a, a motion that is imbalanced. Yeah? So you will get uh, not the, not the uh, tau that you actually wanted. This is what we're going to look at next. So um, a way to extend this formulation is to look at the constraint al control allocation. So that is more of a general problem, um, but we're still talking only about non-rotatable thrusters here. So uh, essentially what we can do is f formulate um, the, control pro or the control allocation problem as a mathematical optimization problem, uh, which uh, has the following um, the form is as presented here. So if we look at this, um, essentially a constraint optimization problem tries to minimize a cost function um, subject to some constraints. And you have some decision variables that you can adjust in order to minimize your cost function uh, and try to stay within um, the limitations given by these constraints. So, and um, uh, so what we have here is, um, uh, this is the cost function. It's a quadratic function of the um, uh, thruster forces F and a select variable S, we come to this later. So essentially what we try to do is um, we want to minimize the thrust that we actually use. Uh, but we also of course want to be able to um, achieve the, um, the desired range as close as possible. And this is why we have um, the select variable S here, which through, through this equation here, the first uh, constraint penalizes any deviation that we might have. So essentially what this means is we have to uh, look for an F that um, first of all is not too large, but then also um, is as close and uh, as close as possible to uh, produces a range that is very very close to the one that we want. So, in case we um, um, exceed the limits of the actuators, we cannot maybe reach the the range that we desire, and this is why we need to a lower deviation. Yeah. So the the second uh, the second uh, constraint here. Um, 
uh, says that uh, this F, the, the thrust of forces that we have, need to be uh, within certain limits or um, give, uh, given by some minimum and some maximum values. So whatever F that we'll find as a solution to this problem will satisfy um, the uh, actuator constraints. The third equation essentially uh, selects um, an upper and lower bound for F and tries to, um, that is also then tried to uh, minimize here in the in the cost function. So what this means is we want to, we don't want one thruster to um, be very, very large while all the others are very, very small. Uh, but instead, um, um, yeah, uh, so we will try to minimize the large thruster. So there are uh, several formulations uh, for this. So this is just uh, one given by Johansson et al. Um, and uh, different formulations can be found. So these, but generally they, they look something like this. These, uh, the matrices W and Q in this optimization problem are weights. So uh, generally positive definite matrices that uh, are then used to uh, give the um, the engineer some some options to like uh, optimize for energy usage or optimize for um, the uh, yeah for closing the gap between the um, resulting range and the real range, and that is by so. Um, if we so if we have this uh, w uh, very very large, then a lot of uh, it's very very costly to use high thruster forces. And then again, if if the q is very very large, then a deviation will be very very costly. So um, this gives uh, like some easy ways of uh, deciding um, what is important for uh, for certain applications. And essentially, um, this uh, problem as it is formulated here is a quadratic programming uh, formulation, um, which can be very efficiently solved um, with uh, modern solvers. And uh, it's also possible if, if the parameters do not change, then um, it's also possible to, to, to find an explicit, explicit solution uh, using piecewise linear functions. So then, then um, it can be used very efficiently online. Yeah, but this unfortunately only works for non-rotatable thrusters. If we have rotatable thrusters, then um, the the minimization problem is a lot more complicated. Um, it's uh, what we'll we'll end up with is a non-convex problem, and these are typically very very hard to solve. So, um, but there is of course a lot of theory also on this, um, which you can look at if you're interested. Okay, that is uh, from my side. Uh, I see a question. Yeah, sorry, just a quick question. I, I guess I missed it. What was what is this F bar in in this optimization problem? Yeah, thanks. Um, so just to clarify, this uh, the F bar is also a decision variable. So um, the uh, um, and it it will be sort of like the largest. Um, it will assume the, the value of the largest um, thrust in absolute uh, terms. So it will be the, the lowest F that is larger than all of the individual forces. And um, essentially this tries to um, penalize especially the largest thrust. Yeah. So while um, the first term in the cost function min tries to minimize um, all of the all of the thrusts, the um, the last term especially uh, focuses on the largest, so it penalizes the largest uh, amount of thrust um, especially. So it's it's like uh, infinity norm that we are considering here, like the supremum of of the all the possible values for all forces, yeah. Um, and then we are penalizing based on basically we are trying to minimize the supremum for the force, yeah. Yeah, um, of the of the selected force, yes, yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Let's 
think there's another question from Olaya. Uh, is there any software or library that has these formulations or thruster models at obtaining the thrust allocation matrices? Um, so the we have our own uh, tools that are um, not yet open sourcely available. Um, I know that there are some tools as part of, for example, the uh, this this uh, yeah, UUV simulator uh, for Gazebo, which comes with a lot of uh, tools. They also have tools for um, the thrust allocation, uh, although they um, rely on the simple simple cases. Uh, I'm not aware of any general library for this, uh, at least not um, um, that uh, handles all of this, handles um, thruster models uh, all the way to um, thruster allocation. Yeah, I mean, also just uh, for well, flow optimization, there are quite a lot of tools out there, uh, most popular yeah. one I can think of is uh, for C++, for example, is I think it's called Alglib, so Algebra Library and it has the quadratic programming. But generally, like the pseudo inverse, <clears throat> I mean, it's quite easy, like even the Eigen Library in C++ has a pseudo inverse uh, function. So that's, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So for um... In, uh, in simple, uh, for simple cases, um, yeah, it's very easy to do sort of by hand. Um, for uh, if it's more involved and uh, um, we're talking about constraint um, control allocation or even constraint uh, control allocation for rotatable thrusters, then um, it will be um, more difficult and uh, and but there are as i said to as we said um, libraries for optimization uh, of course available um, for all languages that can be uh, imagined um, but i not sure if i know anything that is especially for um, for marine robotics and handles the thrusters and, and the, the the specifics of the thrusters Wow. Wow. Wow.